All right. So, um, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. Um, my name is Maya Schoenbach. I'm a clinical psychologist in training. Um, and today we're going to be talking about dermatillomania, specifically uncovering the differences between habits, compulsions, addictions, impulse control. What does this all mean? Where does dermatillomania, skin picking disorder, where does this fall? Um, so we'll go through all of that. The webinar will be probably around 45 minutes and we'll do a Q&A session at the end all together. So I really encourage you guys to write in any questions, any comments that you have throughout the session, write them into the chat and we'll go through them all together at the end. Um, and also I really want to uh, suggest that you stick around to the end because there'll be a promo code at the end of the presentation for a discount uh, for you to subscribe to our program. So definitely stick around for that. So with that, let's get started. Okay. So here, just a quick outline, what we'll go over today. We'll start with, uh, like I said, I'm covering what is the difference between uh, goal, goal uh, determined behavior, habitual behavior. We'll talk a little bit about addictions and compulsions at the beginning, but then we'll dive deeply into, is dermatillomania just a bad habit? Is it a lack of impulse control? Is it considered an addiction? We'll do a conclusion, and then, like I said, we'll do a Q&A all together. Okay, so I like to start off uh, my webinars with a quote. And uh, this is by William James, and he's one of the great philosophers and psychologists um, really of all time. So I'm considering him to be the, the father of American psychology. So way back in 1890, he actually wrote, when we look at living creatures from an outward point of view, one of the first things that strike us is that they're bundles of habits. The more of the details of our daily life that we can hand over to the effortless custody of automatism, the more our higher powers of mind will be set free for their own proper work. So what, what does this really mean? I think what he's trying to say here and why I like this quote is that he's saying that first of all, all living creatures, including human, we, we have habitual behaviors. And, um, Sorry, I just saw a QA and a uh, in the chat. Somebody asked about the Q&A. Yes, right, exactly where you are getting. Um, so in terms of all living creatures, we all uh, have habitual behaviors. And the idea of, of why we need this is that it allows us to free up different cognitive resources that we have, decision-making abilities, um, attention, our executive functioning has to do with the frontal part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex. It allows that, that part to be freed up for more um, determined work, things that we want to plan out. And then we use day-to-day -day things, we do them habitually. So it's really cool to see that, first of all, in the 1800s, this was known, and that it's also across living creatures. So I thought that was a cool thing to start with. But let's get into it. So goals, habits, addictions, compulsions. Oh my, it's kind of a overwhelming topic. But I thought let's start by breaking down the difference between goal-directed versus habitual behaviors. Okay, so goal-directed behavior, what does that mean? They're actions that are done deliberately that we do in order to achieve a specific result. So what that involves is thinking about future consequences and this is able to be adaptable to changes. So for example, an example that I like to use is, for, is if somebody has an exam, like a test, and they study for the test in order to get a good grade. So you're actively deciding to study, that's your goal-directed behavior because you want the reward of a high grade. Okay, and then habitual behaviors. We use the word habit to describe actions that we do automatically 
without thinking about the result. So habits, they're actually driven by triggers, um, things that are like emotions or things that we see in our environment. And habits, they're done automatically and they're also inflexible, okay? So kind of con contrasting it with the goal-directed behavior. So also habits are efficient. So um, that means that they free up like we, I said with a the quote, they free up your attention and your decision-making skills. But the downside of them is that they're not easily changed. I think we can all say, know that breaking a habit is really hard. So let's compare that. Goal-directed actions, again, they're more flexible, like we said, but they, they also require more thought. So an example that I like to give for habitual behavior, biting your nails. So say you're stressed, that could be your trigger. You automatically will bite your nails maybe without thinking about the outcome and you're triggered to do so, to do this behavior of biting your nails from the emotion of feeling stressed, okay? And then also something that this is kind of important, especially in our world of dermatillomania, when habitual behaviors become extreme, they can turn into compulsions or addictions. That's how we like to conceptualize this. Okay, so let's just look at the key differences. So really the key difference between goal-directed versus habitual behavior is if the behavior changes according to whether the outcome is desirable or whether it's not. So in goal-directed behavior, again, if the outcome is no longer desired, then you're gonna stop the behavior. So remember with the exam and studying, Say you're, do, you're studying and you're doing practice tests and you keep doing practice tests, but the, the, the your grades aren't getting any better. So then you might decide, I'm going to stop studying. I've studied enough. And then I'm going to stop the behavior because the outcome is no longer desirable. I'm not, doing, I'm not getting anything better. Versus habitual behavior, the, the behavior continues even if the outcome is no longer desired because the action or the behavior is triggered by a cue like an emotion, not by the outcome itself. So like we said with nail biting, you might continue biting your nails even if it doesn't relieve stress anymore because your brain, it automatically associates the stress, the feeling of stress that automatically com that comes up automatically with the behavior of biting your nails. Um, okay, so let's do another example. Okay, so this is kind of more of a, um, this is, I took this from a, a, a recent paper from 2019. Um, and basically, this is also an example of uh, goal-directed behavior versus um, habitual response. So for example, you see a person sees a bar a sign, and that they call it the stimulus, but that's like the cue, okay? <clears throat> the person enters the bar, they order a glass of wine. That's the, the behavior. They call it the action or the response, but the, the behavior. And then they drink the wine and they feel good. They feel calm. Okay, that's the outcome. So if we break this down into a goal-directed action or a habitual response. So if it's a goal-directed action, just a reminder, we're saying it's driven by the desired outcome. So the desired outcome is the drinking the glass of wine and feeling good and calm. Okay, but say the outcome becomes less valuable or less desired. So for example, the person gets drunk and the person is less likely to order the glass of wine because you're not feeling good and calm anymore. You're feeling maybe sick. So then you're gonna stop the behavior because the, the outcome is no longer desired. Versus say it's a habitual response. Again, it's triggered by the cue. So the cue is seeing the bar sign and you don't think about the outcome, the outcome of drinking the wine and feeling good and calm. You automatically will go in, enter the bar, order the wine, drink the wine, even if you don't really want it anymore. So for example, if you're already drunk, you're going to keep doing it because it's happening automatically. Okay, so this is kind of how they, in the paper, they were explaining how this all happens with um, substance use disorder of alcohol.
And that also kind of takes into here. So um, again, just going over this. So we said that for habits, the behavior continues, even if the outcome is no longer desired. Again, because the action is triggered by the cue, which is often an emotion, not by the outcome itself. But for compulsions and addictions, which we said can be seen as extreme form of habits, that actually involves continuing to do something that used to make you feel good, even though it's causing you problems or call current negative consequences right now. So really this key aspect of addiction or compulsion is that you continue the behavior even when it's causing you harm right now. So I showed this image also from that paper. And here you can see how um, the, the, it's called compulsive reward seeking behaviors. They're really implicated in a lot of different mental health disorders. So here, the classic example of substance addiction, um, but they also showed binge eating different and then different types of behavioral addiction. So gambling, internet use, shopping, those are all types of compulsive reward seeking behaviors. Okay, <clears throat> so from all of this, we can understand that dermatillomania is not goal-directed behavior, right? Because dermatillomania, skin picking disorder, it's not, um, we're not uh, changing the behavior because of the outcome that's desired. So, is skin picking or is dermatillomania just a bad habit? Let's see. So, in the DSM 5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fifth edition, which is the book that we use um, in the mental health field to diagnose uh, mental health disorders, there's very, very specific criteria in order to receive the diagnosis of skin picking disorder or of dermatillomania. So the first thing is recurrent skin picking that results in skin lesions. So essentially it causes damage. The person has repeated attempts to decrease or to stop the skin picking. So essentially you try to stop the behavior. And then these are really important, but the skin picking causes clinically significant distress or impairment. So it could be in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. So this clinical significant um, impair, uh, impairment. And then um, the skin picking can't be attributable to uh, the psychological effect of a substance. So for example, cocaine um, or another medical condition and that's uh, scabies is often cited there. And then finally, the skin picking is not better explained by symptoms of another mental disorder. So for example, um, hallucinations in a psychotic disorder or in body dysmorphic disorder when there's a perceived defect or flaw in the body, um, things like that, or, or uh, self-harm, uh, non-suicidal self-injury, self-harm, it can't be better described to that. Those are like differential diagnoses that we use. So these are the very specific criteria that we use um, when talking about skin picking disorder. So let's talk about bad habits to skin picking disorder. So we said that bad habits are considered bad because the behavior is undesirable or not good for your overall health, right? We said in an extreme form of a habit, it's a bad habit, but this is the big kind of difference. Is when the impact of the habit is causing you significant dysfunction and it's hindering your, your daily function, that's when you need to consider whether or not there's the presence of a clinical disorder, whether or not there's a diagnosis that could be involved. So like we just went over the diagnostic criteria, it clearly describes the inability to, to reduce the behavior, to reduce the picking or stop the picking. Um, and again, like some argue where we, we could all argue that bad, all bad habits are difficult to stop. But really, it's this, this combination of this that you can't stop it, again, with the, the dysfunction, the functional impairment, and the significant emotional distress. Those are the things that separate 
this disorder from a bad habit. Okay, so we can understand from this that skin baking, we said it's not goal-directed behavior, and we said it's not just a bad habit, right? But what about impulse control? Okay, impulse control is a whole other realm. Maybe it's a lack of impulse control. Okay, so what is impulse control? It's it's um, the ability to resist or to delay an urge or a drive or a temptation. And really it stops you from performing acts that could be harmful to yourself or to others. Um, it involves the, the ability to manage and to regulate your, your emotions and your behaviors, um, particularly in response to external things or an internal drive. And then it allows you to do this in a way that aligns with your long-term goals and also societal norms. Okay, so there, there are kind of like many aspects to all of this. Let's break them down. So the key aspects. So first it's resisting temptation. So it's really the ability to, to refrain from, from doing a behavior that's immediately, immediately gratifying, but it could be potentially harmful or counterproductive for you. Um, so that's resisting the temptation. Then there's the delay of the gratification. It's the, the ability to postpone having an immediate reward right now um, in, in favor of, of having a long-term, more significant, maybe more significant outcome. Um, we said emotion regulation. So managing um, emotional responses. So um, not having an impulsive reaction that could be from intense feelings, things like anger, frustration, or even excitement. Like it doesn't have to always be um, uncomfortable, more like negative emotions or uncomfortable emotions. It could also be excitement. Sometimes you think of a little kid that's so excited they break their toy because they're so excited. Um, and then finally, cognitive control. Um, so it's this idea of higher order cognitive processes. So that's what we said, remember, with the quote in William James. So it's things like planning, decision making, problem solving. Um, so it's a lot using all of these these higher order uh, resources that you do to inhibit your your impulsive behaviors. Okay. So why is impulse control important? So. First of all, your personal well-being. So having effective impulse control, it's associated with having better both mental and physical health outcomes. Um, because like we said, it helps you avoid uh, engaging in risky or self-destructive behaviors. So it's, it's important. Um, it's important for social functioning because it, it allows you to, to have positive social interactions and to have relationships because it allows you to act in a socially acceptable way and, and really consider the consequences of your actions. You're not going to go around, say you're angry at them, you're not going to go screaming at them, even though you may want to, <laughs> um, um, because it's not socially acceptable. And then it allows you to understand the consequences of your actions, things about like empathy, things like that. Um, and then goal achievement. So uh, it's it allows you to, to have goal-directed behavior and, and persistently stay focused on long-term goals, long-term objectives, um, even though you might have short-term temptations or distractions. So think about the studying for an exam example. Example, your friend might call you, say, do you want to come uh, out for, um, for food? No, I need to study. Like the idea of staying focused on your long-term goal. Okay, so impulse control disorders. These are actually a group of behavioral conditions that um, really make it difficult to control your your reactions or your, your actions or your reactions. And we, and a, a key aspect of it is that these behaviors they often cause harm to others or to yourself and often they lead to issues with the law 
So these are the, the four that are um, listed in the, the DSM is kleptomania. So it's this uh, irresistible urge to, to steal, to steal things that you don't actually need for, for your personal use or for monetary value. Um, pyromania, it's this, this uh, urge to start fires or to relieve tension in order to relieve tension or for, for this like instant gratification. Um, there's intermittent explosive disorder. So it's this idea that you have recurrent um, episodes of, of aggressive outbursts and typically that leads to assault or, or uh, you destroy other people's property or property in general. Um, and then finally, pathological gambling. So it's this inability to resist the urge to gamble and that has to lead to significant personal um, and financial consequences. That's a important criteria. Okay, so is dermatillomania an impulse control disorder? So let's look at the shared features of both of them. So both, both dermatillomania and impulse control disorders can involve um, repetitive behaviors, like we said, and um, they cause dis significant distress and impairment in functioning. Remember, those are the key um, criteria. And both, actually, this is interesting, they commonly coexist in the same person. They could, you could have both dermatillomania and an impulse control disorder. Um, and that actually makes diagnosis and treatment more complicated. So this is from a very, very recent, a few months ago, uh, paper that was released. Um, so is it an impulse control disorder? The answer is no. Um, it's actually, dermatillomania is actually categorized as an obsessive compulsive and related disorder in the DSM-5. And um, so this paper uh, re recently, the, the, the Grant and his colleagues, what they did is they, they talked about the differences between um, impulse control disorder and BFRDs or specifically for uh, dermatillomania and trichotillomania. And they said that it's because of, um, well, there's a lot of uh, research that shows that there's so much commonalities between OCD and um, BFRBs and dermatillomania. So in terms of the symptomology and the behavior. So dermatillomania, yes, it involves this repetitive behavior driven by urges. And it's similar to the behavior seen in, in OCD. So the, it's this compulsive nature of skin picking and really this inability to resist the urge. And that they said that it aligns more closely with, with OCD related behaviors than with in, impulse control disorders. So the cognitive and emotional patterns of it. So people typically experience the urge to pick their skin and engage in a repetitive behavior Often it's to alleviate tension or to achieve some sense of a relief. And really it's this, this pattern um, that is similar to what they see in the cognitive and the emotional experiences in OCD. And then also they talked about their shared treatment approaches. So treatments that have been effective for OCD, things like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And then I'm saying this with a asterisk, a little star, uh, SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There is no currently FDA approved medication specifically for dermatillomania, but some SSRIs have been found to be effective for dermatillomania. But they say that this therapeutic overlap suggests that dermatillomania and trichotillomania BFRBs are more appropriately categorized with OCD and related disorders than with impulse control. Um, and then finally, a little biology. Um, so there's genetic and neurobiological factors. So research shows it that um, dermatillomania might have genetic and, and neurobiological um, underpinnings with OCD and other related disorders. So really there's studies that have found um, familial links, um, similar brain pattern activity um, between these disorders. So it really, all of these things support the classification of these disorders together as obsessive compulsive and related disorders and not putting dermatillomania with the impulse control disorders. Okay, so we've gone through a lot of this. 
So we understand that skin picking is not goal-directed behavior. We said it's not just a bad habit because again, it needs to cause this, this significant distress and also the functional impairment. And then we said it's not an impulse control disorder because it really is more similar to obsessive compulsive disorders like OC in related disorders, so OCD and related disorders. But what about um, addiction? Could dermatillomania be an addiction? So uh, a lot of our clients have actually uh, described this, this inability to stop picking and this irresistible urge um, and the nature of the urge feeling similar to, to an addiction. So they say, often say, I just can't stop or I feel addicted to this. Um, and interestingly enough, about 25% of people with um, a BFRD in general also suffer from an addiction. Um, and then the paper said that also realistically, this number is likely higher uh, because people, there's unfortunately underreporting of things because there's a lot of shame, stigma surrounding both addiction, but also surrounding dermatillomania. But this high comorbidity or coexistence of these behaviors doesn't mean that BFRBs are, are, are addictions. Um, really, a lot of factors play, play a role. So it's really important to understand this, this link um, in order to distinguish between um, addiction and compulsion or addiction and BFRBs. Okay, so let's go through this compulsive picking cycle. So this is kind of a way that we like to conceptualize the typical experience of skin picking disorder. So cycle often starts off with a trigger. So this trigger varies from person to person. Triggers can include stress, anxiety. It could be boredom. Um, it could be that you maybe look in the mirror and you perceive an imperfection in your skin, or maybe even feel a physical sensation on your skin and it feels different. So that's the physical sensation that's the trigger. And then following the trigger, you have a strong, strong urge to pick the skin. And this urge is, dip, is intense and it's really difficult to resist. Um, and so the, the drive behind the urge, it could be maybe a desire for relief. It could be a sense of gratification. Sometimes there's a sense of, of accomplishment after picking. A lot of our clients uh, talk about that. Um, even a need for control that also could be um, an a underlying driving factor of the urge. And then after the urge, despite the fact that you try and resist, the person will succumb to the urge and they begin picking their skin. And again, when I say picking, it could be scratching, squeezing, um, like digging at the the imperfections or the perceived blemishes or the irregularities, whatever, picking. And then typically there's temporary relief. So it could say, again, like we said, a sense of relief or satisfaction even. It could temporarily alleviate the initial feelings of anxiety, of stress, um, the, the uncomfortable feeling. And really this temporary relief of the, the negative emotion, this is the, the key element that reinforces the behavior and it strengthens the cycle and strengthens this compuls the compulsion to pick in the future. However, this temporarily subsides, the picking episode subsides, and then come up all of the feelings, the guilt, the shame, the embarrassment, those are typically the long lasting emotions that are res a result of the picking cycle. And then why is it a cycle? Because these feelings could be the trigger for another cycle, okay? Because we said the trigger often is an uncomfortable emotion. So then you, you're stuck in this 
compulsive thinking cycle. So now let's talk about the addiction cycle. So it kind of starts off similarly. So there's the idea of a trigger. So again, it could be things like stress, um, uncomfortable negative emotions. And then this is also something that's important. It's also environmental cues. So it could also be in, um, in skin picking, but uh, remember with the bar sign, you see the bar, that's something in the environment. And then here we call, instead of an urge, we call it a craving. It's an intense desire for the addictive substance or the behavior. And then there is typically a ritual that's included uh, before uh, using the, the substance or the behavior. So it's typically a routine or, or something, a habit even, like it's an automatic thing that's associated with obtaining the substance or engaging in the behavior. So uh, rolling a cigarette, that might be one or engaging the behavior with the, the ordering the wine. It could be maybe talking to the bartender, something like that. And then there's the actual consumption of the substance or you engage in the behavior. And then um, there's typically feelings of regret and hopelessness, shame that happen after using. And then again, those could be the trigger for the next cycle and then you get stuck in this addictive cycle. So let's try and um, differentiate between picking and addiction. So let's talk about the nature of the urge. So an addiction, we call it a craving. The craving has this uh, desire for pleasure, or for relief um, that you get from the substance or from the behavior. But then in compulsive picking, it's typically driven by a need to reduce the anxiety or distress from some intrusive thought or from that you have, you feel this anxiety or distress. The focus of the relief is different also. So in addiction, you're focused on feeling pleasure or gaining a high from doing the behavior or, or using the substance. Um, whereas in picking, you're typically focused on reducing anxiety or reducing discomfort. Again, it could be the sense of gratification, but the, ma the majority are the way we typically conceptualize it is for to reduce the anxiety or discomfort. So behaviorally, in addiction, um, it usually you use a substance or behavior that leads you to pleasure. Um, and then this is kind of repetitive, sorry, but uh, the compulsive, the, the picking um, is typically repetitive in order to alleviate the anxiety. It's not necessarily for pleasure. Um, and then the emotional aftermath is in addiction. It's uh, typically guilt and shame after the pleasure fades. And um, in compulsion, the compulsive picking, it's that the guilt and the shame from typically the inability to control the picking. And again, the dysfunction, the, the, the disruption that it does to your life. Um, we have lots of clients that they don't want to go out. They don't want to show because they're afraid of their people seeing their, their, their scarring, their blemishes. Um, so in terms of insight and awareness, so uh, people with... Um, dermatillomania are often aware of the harm caused by their picking um, and they try to stop but they can't um, whereas uh, people struggling with addiction typically lack awareness of the harm that the their actions are, are inflicting and they really only uh, recognize it once significant damage has happened and then in terms of attempting to modify the behavior so people with uh, uh, dermatillomania, you repeatedly attempt to stop picking. It's a criteria for the diagnosis. Um, again, showing the awareness of the harmful nature of the behavior. Um, and then similarly, uh, people struggling with addiction, they may attempt to quit, but usually it happens after substantial damage. And there's typically, like we said, less awareness of the severity while the behavior is happening. 
Okay, so I wanted to talk about different addictions. So alcohol, so common, we talked about this with the example. Cigarettes, very common. Sugar. Caffeine. Prescription drugs. Illicit drugs. Exercise. So these are all kind of behaviors, substances, things that could be addictive, are addictive, and you can have an addiction too. So I want to leave this as an open-ended question for you. So we talked, we, I showed there's addiction to sugar, to caffeine, alcohol, drugs. It's, it's a spectrum. Right. So I think I just want to leave it with you guys also to think about where where do we draw the line? Um, and I think if we tie it back to kind of the, the quote at the beginning of the presentation, this idea that that habitual behaviors are something that we need. Right. Like these are things that we need in order to free up our higher order cognitive resources, our decision-making, our problem-solving ability. As living beings, this is something that we need. And I know, I don't know about you guys, but caffeine, coffee a day, great, sounds great to me. But at what point does it become an addiction? And where do you draw the line in calling addiction to sugar versus caffeine versus alcohol and drugs? So I think um, kind of like we talked about in terms of the idea of how much disruption it causes to your life, um, how much emotional distress, dysfunction, those are kind of the areas of the, the where it, it turns in the, in the spectrum to a clinical disorder. But I think it's important for every single person to also consider this question for themselves. So I want to pose it to you. Where do you draw the line? So I just wanted to go over quickly, we talked about today, goals, habits, addictions, and compulsions. Is dermatillomania just a bad habit? No, it's not. It needs to ca cause significant emotional distress, disrupt, um, cause significant uh, dysfunction in your life. It's not a lack of impulse control because it's more, research has shown, it's way more uh, phenomenologically uh, similar to OCD. So that's why it's under the umbrella term of obsessive compulsive and related disorders. Um, and is it an addiction? We show the differences between the addictive cycle and the compulsive picking cycle, but there are a lot of similarities. And a lot of people talk about this feeling of this, the addictive urge to, to pick, um, but there are differences. So um, again, kind of leaving things a little open-ended. So I just wanted to share a little bit of free resources that we have here at Skin Pick. So our monthly webinars, if you're jo joining one right now, we also have lots of other ones. We have Q and A sessions with therapists. We have mindfulness uh, workshops. Um, so definitely um, recommend that you join them. And then also um, we post all of our recorded webinars on our YouTube page. So definitely go check those out or on our website. Um, on our website, you can also find our online forums, our blogs, and really those are a great place to interact with um, other people facing similar challenges, um, ask each other questions, comments. Um, so look at our website, skinpick.com. And then finally, um, I really suggest joining or following our social media. It's such a good opportunity for community, um, really great center for information, for treatment options. Um, we have Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, we have uh, X, Twitter. <laughs> um, but definitely search us at, at skinpick.com. So I want to say thank you to all of you for joining me today. Um, and definitely don't uh, forget that we have a hundred dollar discount for the first month of subscription. If you use the promo code proweb100, we have it written down here at the bottom. Um, and if you have any questions about our program, about um, 
anything technical, um, you can email support at skinpick.com. Um, you can also email me, but um, also if you want have more, maybe more clinical or personal questions, you can email me at maya at helpingminds.com. Um, okay, great. So let's start with a QA. and a Let's see some questions in the chat. So yes, Q and A here in the chat. Somebody said, uh, comment, nail biting is not the best example because it is a BFRB. You're right, it definitely is a BFRB. Um, skin picking, hair pulling, uh, nail biting, cheek biting, these are all examples of BFRBs. Um, you're right. <laughs> um, but I wanted to show that of an automatic uh, Habitual, yeah. So my skin picking is goal directed because it's driven by perfectionism. I want the skin smooth with no raised scabs, etc. etc. I do no goal and outcome, but damaging to skin. Um, I'm not so sure about the question. I think though, maybe we did touch on this: the idea that it doesn't have to be always the urge doesn't have to be to reduce anxiety or distress. It sometimes could be like you're saying perfectionism, this idea of having perfect smooth skin or even um, sense of satisfaction, right? That's also sometimes um, uh, kind of the underlying driver for the urge, but it is different in terms of the, so I guess you're saying that's your goal. Um, but then I ask you if it, you have skin picking disorder, if it's causing you significant um, emotional distress, is it causing you dysfunction? Like that's, remember, those are the criteria for dermatillomania. Um, so that's maybe the difference. The next question was, would having OCD be considered a separate issue, an impulse disorder or another mental disorder contributing to this problem? So like we said, um, there is a whole family of disorders, impulse control disorders. And then there's the family of obsessive compulsive and related disorders. And kind of the way we like to think about it is that um, dermatillomania and trichotillomania are maybe like siblings and they're kind of like cousins with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. So they're under the same umbrella, the same family. Um, that's kind of how I like to explain. Okay, so okay, so somebody wrote, I disagree. I know what I'm doing with the goal of smooth skin. So that is, so maybe, so like I said, so maybe that is really the difference. If you know you have this goal of having smooth skin, then maybe you don't have dermatillomania because it's not causing you emotional distress or significant um, uh, functional impairment. So maybe you are pick, you pick your skin, but it's not considered skin picking disorder. The next question is, can this behavior be learned as a child? I ask because I want to stop hangnail picking, set a good example for my one-year-old son. I don't want him to start doing it because of me. So yes, this behavior, um, dermatillomania, um, BFRBs can start as children for sure. Um, again, is it? we don't know the interaction between nature versus nurture. We don't know how. There is definitely some genetic component learned behaviors for sure also there um yeah maybe it is a good idea to to try and be aware of it first for you maybe try and see when it happens the most if you're doing it because of stress um if you do it because of the feeling then you can um try and maybe keep your nails as um trim as possible um things like that because yeah it definitely can start as a child Somebody wrote many triggers are visual. Um, yes, I hope that um, I was showing uh, different ideas of addiction with the purpose of explaining um, 
I did not mean to trigger anyone. Um, somebody wrote anyone using Duplexent for this. I'm actually not sure. If you want, uh, I can look this up. Um, a psychologist, not a psychiatrist, so I don't work uh, specifically with um, medication. Like I don't prescribe medication, but I could definitely look this up for you to consult with any colleagues. Um, if you're interested, definitely send me an email by at helpingminds.com and I'll, I'll do that for you. Uh, next question is exploration dis disorder and dermatillomania the same? Yep, great question. We have lots of names for it. Uh, skin picking disorder, exploration disorder, dermatillomania, uh, they're all uh, under the family of BFRB or body focused repetitive behavior, but yes. Next question. Are you aware of research testing interventions to treat dermatillomania as an addiction having good results? Um, I'm actually not aware of that because the best treatment really is um, the gold standard of treatment for dermatillomania is habit reversal uh, therapy, habit reversal treatment, HRT. It's a form of CBT. Um, and it's different than for addiction. So that I, I would go by the best gold standard if you want to work on treatment, definitely with that. We, we actually get here at Skin Pick, we uh, use uh, HRT. Um, and you can go work with the therapist one on one uh, for that. It's all done online from the comfort of your own home. Next question is how do you stop the urge to? I'm assuming to pick. Um, so, like I said, so habit reversal therapy. Um, I'm going to answer this question too at the same time. What is proven to help slash stop? I'm assuming you guys are both asking the same question. Um, so, okay, so habit reversal uh, treatment, it involves a couple, a bunch of different um, things, but a big thing is awareness training. You work on um, identifying patterns of when you're uh, picking, look at all the underlying factors of where, when, how, why, what are your triggers, emotions, um, and then you find I'm saying this in a nutshell, but essentially replacement behaviors, things that you can do instead of the picking itself. And then you find um, ways to modify your environment. We call it stimulus control. You find ways to modify your environment in order to reduce triggers. And you do all of this simultaneously, like you do it step by step, but then you do it all simultaneously. So you kind of attack the problem from a bunch of different angles. And if you sign up for Skin Pick, we work on the, with this, and we also work with um, another type of uh, CBT, uh, it's called uh, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And basically, we also work with the, all the underlying emotions that often lead to skin picking itself. Um, so let me know if you have any more questions about that. As a parent, what should you not say when you see picking going on? Um, so a big thing, I think, is to not um, react intensely, not cause shame, because I think that is something that already people very, very often feel. Um, so I would maybe try and approach it in a very calm manner, ask them about it instead of saying, uh -huh, I caught you, things like that. Um, so I think that is a very, very big first tip. Um, somebody wrote about nail biting, um, maybe learning it from their parent. Yeah, they, definitely you could learn it um, from your parent, for sure. Um, FYI, there are a lot of potential causes. It's not going to be just because your child sees you 100%. Like I said, nature, nurture, there's lots of underlying factors. Um, yes. I'm going to start it this week. I hope you mean uh, skin pick and not uh, picking <laughs> our treatment. <laughs> 
somebody wrote, I've noticed that my six-year-old daughter is displaying signs of dermatillomania and trichotillomania. I've suffered from dermatillomania since I was very young, four years old. How do I support my daughter and help her avoid the shame I've felt for 30 years? So we actually have a parent program. Um, so I would definitely recommend signing up for that. So you can go through it yourself because your daughter's um, only six years old. It's for children that are uh, younger. Um, and first of all, you will maybe hopefully gain help for yourself, but also then gain tools to help your daughter. So we, um, the main difference between the parent program and the personal program is, is that we also provide ways of communicating um, all the information that you'll learn that also will benefit you. I think this is a perfect, perfect example for you because you're getting double the bang for your buck. You're able to treat yourself, hopefully, and then also... Uh, learn ways to communicate this for your uh, daughter as well. So um, look up our parent program. Um, I have dermatillomania since 2020. I hope to find something to stop. So definitely, like I said, using um, HRT, that's definitely the gold standard treatment. Um, and we, we definitely uh, provide that. Good seminar, thank you. <laughs> I've not allowed myself to join these before. As I might have been thinking problem, I'm so glad that someone I joined, thank you. Um, I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed um, and definitely um, check out our other webinars um, on our YouTube page. We don't have very much time, so I'm just gonna answer the rest of the questions. What about using hypnosis? I don't really know of uh, research that shows that hypnosis is actually beneficial, um, but if it's important, you can uh, email me and I can try and look some up, um, but that's definitely not the gold standard of treatment. Let me ask about retinol cream to help with scarring. Um, that definitely talk to a dermatologist. You said you saw a dermatologist. Um, in terms of the scarring, I like I know more about the the mental, the the emotional disturbances that happen with it. In terms of the actual scarring issues, definitely talk to a doctor. Um, does the program include speaking with a therapist, or is it just webinars and resources? No, it does include us uh, speaking with a therapist. It's uh, all text based uh, communication. Um, you can book a, a video chat, but it's typically the main program is text-based and they answer within 24 hours. So definitely um, look up our um, program. Okay, um, we don't actually have any more time. Um, I see that there's some more questions about mental health uh, professionals on this disorder. Um, if you have any more questions, definitely don't hesitate to email me, um, but I'm very happy that you are all very engaged and this will be, the recording will be on our website and on YouTube. Thanks everybody.